We're done with cauldron. We're done with cauldron. Done with cauldron. Damn it. Hey, Jarek here, and I think we have finally done it. We finally found a cauldron game that's not bad! Yeah, I didn't hate myself playing this game, what is the world coming to? After suffering through so many hours of all these terrible cauldron games, I finally get a reward. A cauldron game that's so bad, it's good. Now don't get me wrong, this is not one of the best games I've ever played, far from it. In fact, its Metacritic is pretty solidly around 5 out of 10, which yeah, 5 or 6 out of 10 is pretty accurate, but I was kind of liking my experience. I just wanted to see what next ridiculous thing would happen. It wasn't too frustrating, it wasn't too annoying, it was just entertaining. So I guess I'll start with the PC release. And for once, there's a lot of issues that aren't exactly the game's fault. This game released on PC in 2005, then a year later on the PS2 in 2006. This is that awkward in-between time, the 360 hadn't come out yet, but it's just before next console generation. And yeah, this aesthetic really looks like it. I don't know, to me this just looks like an OG Xbox game. But more importantly, this game wasn't made with widescreen in mind, so if you try to play it in widescreen, it kind of breaks a lot of things. For starters, the FOV isn't exactly made for widescreen, so it kind of gets all scrunched up. In order to fix this, you just have to enable the console and then change the FOV. Half-Life 1 has the same problem. The bigger issue is that this royally messes with the HUD. If playing in widescreen, you literally cannot see how much ammo you have. You also can't see what you picked up. It should be in the top right over there, it's just not. I have no idea how much ammo I have. Thankfully, you can see your health in the top left. Playing through this game without knowing how much health you have would have been just a total pain. Now, this game is Abandonware. You can't buy it anywhere, so I downloaded this off myabandonware.com, not sponsored. This also comes with a fix that fixes a lot of the graphical issues that will happen when you try to play it in widescreen, but there's still going to be a few left over. For example, in the graphics options, you literally can't tell if options are turned on or off. Clicking them definitely changes options, you just don't know. I didn't realize some of these options were turned off until I got to the water world, and man, they make a huge difference. Some critical visual effects will not happen if you don't turn on some of these settings. For example, at one point, you have a freeze gun, and its split function will make a platform. But if these options aren't turned on, you can't see the platform at all. This is sort of the tutorial for the gun, so this is where they're teaching you that that split function is a thing. So I didn't even know that I could make a platform at all, and I couldn't see it. So if you plan on playing this game on modern systems, do keep that in mind. Other than that, I didn't have any issues at all. The game always stayed a solid frame rate. I had one crash the entire eight or nine hours I played. Any problem I had was just because I was playing this game on a modern system 17 years after launch. There wasn't even mouse acceleration. The aim felt fine, and that's a first for Cauldron. Then we moved to the actual graphics, and you know what? This game actually doesn't look that bad for 2005, especially not for a PS2 release. I'm sure a few things would have been dialed back and the frame rate wouldn't have been as good on the PS2, but still, you get my point. There is a wide variety of landscapes in this game, and all of them have a distinct look. There's a ton of different guns, all with their own unique animations. There's tons of different alien species you'll see walking around. And yeah, while this isn't exactly pushing the limit of games at that time, it's also not a bad looking game at all. Like I said, this actually reminds me a lot of an OG Xbox game. I don't know what it is. I think it's just the bubbly HUD and kind of rounder art style, yet still very gamery. Something about this just reminds me of the original Xbox. Now we move on to the story and <laughs> this game is really ambitious, both in good and bad ways. Let's start with the good. Gene Troopers does a good job setting up the game's universe. In their previous game, Chaser, you kind of just got thrown from one place to the next without much context and you didn't really know what was going on. In this game, there's tons of different worlds, yet you'll frequently find yourself going back to your spaceship or some sort of spaceport. You generally know when you're about to travel and why you're traveling. And anytime you do go to a new planet, you will meet a new species that inhabits that planet. It's obvious someone had a vision in their head that they wanted to fulfill. So then what is the story? Well, the game starts with your main character getting abducted and turned into what is called a GT, or at least half turned into a GT. The process was interrupted. 
which I guess in this case just means you get blue tattoos all over yourself. You were rescued by Al, a weird bug looking creature. The person that you were with at the beginning of this game is your daughter. She has been captured and you've been split up. So the main focus of the game is to get your daughter back, but the story isn't that straightforward. During your escape from the GT outpost, you get possessed by something called the Seed of Bane. Gameplay wise, this means you get new abilities, but lore wise, this means it's going to try to take you over. Effectively, this becomes a rush. Try to save your daughter before you get taken over by the Seed. But like I said, the story is not straightforward. You have full character dialogue trees with tons of people in this game. You'll frequently visit this bar, which has alien species in every direction and you can talk to pretty much any of them. Some of them may give you a backstory to certain parts of this universe. Other ones may have a totally pointless conversation that you didn't even need to have, but it's optional, so that's fine. Some of these will even open up optional side quests that you can decline or accept. Accepting or declining may actually change parts of the game. For example, if you decline this person's offer, they'll straight up attack you later on. This is you just trying to walk through the spaceport. This isn't anything important to the story. So yeah, this game is really ambitious for what it wants to be. A little too ambitious. The voice acting in this game is something of legend. It's not quite as bad as Chaser. Stone. He was on Majestic. In addition to the cloning facility, he's also built a dark eye. Dark Eye. Chaser, the game I've just showed you, has some of the worst voice acting I've ever heard in any game. However, this game has bad voice acting that's so bad it's good. It's not bad enough to completely make me not listen to anything they're saying, but it's clearly not good either. Also, sometimes when they speak, it looks like those videos where it's 500% facial expressions. Like, were they attempting to make actual lip syncing here? Like, what's going on with this face? At its best, it's fine. I can listen to it and I understand what's going on. At its worst, it's just downright hilarious. I brought you back to life, and I can give you powers beyond belief. Do you want to stand by my side? The artifact won. <laughs> what is this? I brought you back so I can kill you. I don't get it. This is not, well, it's not natural. Then you already got the answer. What? What do you mean? What is it when it's not natural? Supernatural, I guess. <laughs> and now, if you excuse me. This writing. Wow, you can just tell her, shut the f up, child. <laughs> anyway, this game is even more ambitious because these options actually change the story and you have multiple endings. Hell, there's an option about 60, 70% of the way through the game that can literally just kill some of your squad mates, depending on what you do. This actually reminded me a lot of Jedi Knight, where you can just kind of choose to be evil or good. The good ending was definitely the intended ending because that leads on a to be continued. With this new threat, Marine is still not saved. My fight is not over. Okay, so th then he basically just said, hey, there's all these people coming to destroy the universe. Here's a sequel. All right, so that, that makes sense. I feel like that was the intended ending you were supposed to get. The bad endings though are hilarious. This is our king. What do they want from me? They want you to lead them into battle against the entire GE. Everyone wants evil, so f*** yeah. it. Let's go evil. I am their leader. I will lead them into the war. What? The game just ends that way? I'm sorry? Out of all the times you could have ended the game, there was like four different bosses where it felt like the game was going to end right after. And instead you end it where it feels like the game is going to continue. 
What? <laughs> what kind of ending is that? I wonder what happens if I choose something else. Oh, is this just a final cutscene? Oh, okay, here we go. You lied to me. Al was right. You are evil. Millions of innocent people would die. I will never do this. In this ending, you just die. Yeah, you just die. <laughs> That's just the other ending. The good ending, you become the the villain of the universe, the bad ending, you just f***ing die. So that's the too long didn't play of the story, and trust me, there is way more to talk about, but I'll let you play it if you want to. So now we move to the gameplay, and it's a shooter that came out after Half-Life 2. Every single game that came out after Half-Life 2 needed to have a car section and a gravity gun. Gene Troopers is no exception. Hell, the gravity gun in this game even looks like the one from Time Splitter's Future Perfect, and it's even less useful. There simply are not enough props in the environment to ever need to use this thing. On top of that, you barely throw things at all, and it really doesn't do that much damage, so like, what's the point? And that was the same problem that both Doom 3 Resurrection of Evil and Time Splitter's Future Perfect had. There just wasn't really the props to utilize something like this. And if any living entity gets in the way while you're holding something, you just drop it, leading to stupid stuff like this. It did use the Havoc engine, so the physics are there, including enemies just kind of suddenly dying from Source Engine-style things. Alright, where's the- What the- What- What happened? Why did they die? In a similar way, the car sections just don't really add anything to this game. They're very brief, you don't shoot anything while you're in the car, you just drive a little bit, you get a roadblock, you get out, you clear the roadblock, and then you keep driving for a bit. This car handles terribly, but thankfully you only see it twice in the entire game, both times being very brief. So now that that's out of the way, what about the rest of the gameplay? Well, it's kind of similar to Chaser if Chaser wasn't really frustrating and annoying and drag on for 16 hours. This game's length is actually acceptable. It's about eight hours long, so that's pretty average of that time. On top of that, it's far less repetitive than Chaser was. You'll very frequently be finding yourself hopping from one world to the next. And every time you go to a new world, you get entirely different scenery with entirely different enemies. You also tend to get entirely different guns every time you go to a new world. So while the gameplay itself is not anything special or crazy, it at least is varied, it changes itself up. But how did it avoid the problems Chaser had? And Chaser, I found myself slowly creeping on walls because I'd be shot twice and have no health suddenly. And since there wasn't any health regeneration or anything, it was just a slog to play through. And on top of that, the enemies were hit scan, and the whole game was just awful. Well, the enemies actually kind of still act the same way. In fact, at the beginning, it can be kind of nonsense because enemies will just shoot you out of nowhere and you don't know where you're getting shot from. I'm taking damage from snipers here. I didn't know that. I didn't know they existed. I have no idea where I'm even being shot from. However, remember when I said you can get upgrades and abilities due to the Seed of Bane? This is the main fix for that problem. These upgrades make the game a lot less annoying. The two main ones that are very overpowered is just getting more health and having health regen. At the end, you'll have close to 1000 health and be able to regen all of it. On top of that, you get other abilities like the ability to just suddenly get all of your health back. This will cost some energy that you will pick up from enemies when they die. When you pick up this energy, it also gives you a little bit of health back, but it's pretty small. That's what that bar is over on the top left. That's how much energy you have. This does not recharge on its own. You do need to kill living things to get this energy back, which is why the robot enemies are so annoying. You don't get anything for killing them. And yeah, there's quite a few different useful abilities here. Early on, I tried out bull time, which was pretty useful, but in the end, there was a few abilities that I settled on. One made me do double the damage and had double the resistance. This is obviously very strong. The other just gave me all my health back, like I said before. There wasn't another ability that I thought would be interesting, and that was the ability to grab people and kill them with a gravity gun. Basically, force grip, or the supercharged gravity gun at the end of Half-Life 2. 
However, two things about that. The upgrades are based on their amount of health, and usually you can't just grab people and kill them. And on top of that, the gravity gun is worthless in this game because it barely throws anything anywhere, so this didn't end up being that useful. Sounded fun, but the results were kind of bad. There are more abilities, but my main point here is that these abilities make the game less tedious and repetitive and boring like Chaser was. And I came to that conclusion because at one point, the game actually took them away and it made the game so obnoxious real quick. Now, it was one very brief section, probably only lasted 10, 15 minutes, but I hated all of it and it reminded me a lot of Chaser. Oh, well, I'm dead here. Yep. I'm tired of your bullshit. My point out of this is that Gene Troopers is not an awful game. It's not a really good game or anything like that, but it's not Chaser. They clearly learned from their previous experiment, and that raises questions. If Gene Troopers ended up actually being decent, what happened to Cauldron? How did they go from Gene Troopers to all the garbage they were putting out on the 360? Also, how did Chaser become the game that gets published on Steam and Gene Troopers becomes abandonware? Why not the other way around? Cauldron is such a weird development studio, but with them being pulled into Bohemia Interactive, and this being the last Cauldron game I needed to cover, no, I'm not going to cover the Cabela's hunting games, I don't care, we can finally put Cauldron Games to rest. So I guess it's fitting that we would play Cauldron's best game by far to end it. I want to give a big thanks to all of you that watched this video and everyone that joined me over on Twitch while I was streaming. If you subscribe to my Twitch, you get to see my videos at least one week ahead of time. It was a lot of fun hanging out with you guys, and I'll see you next video.